thank you, Nathan, for coming. And um, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. So do I. And, and, um, I'll know what it is once I've said it. I said to you before, you have, you're, you have a hard act to follow, but I'm sure you will be fine. Indeed I do. Firstly, let me convey my thanks to you all for convening uh, this conference. Um, you never know how much you need help of this type until something like this happens in your own family. And uh, we all share that uh, burden and I'm, I'm grateful that an organisation like this exists and I'm grateful that uh, you have the clout to be able to invite somebody like Greg Walsh along. I learned a, a very great deal from his talk. Um, can everybody see? We're running with Plan B with our audio visual, so I hope everybody will be able to read this. Um, just so that you can track the pattern of my thinking, I'm going to spend some time, but not the whole session, talking about my family's story. But then I'm going to try and move on from that and draw some common threads that hopefully will make my story relevant to your stories and to this organisation, because there are some differences and then to talk about what's been done to try and bring some justice or understanding to the situation. And then also to then pose the question, what, what is to be done? What can be done? Uh, because I'm a doer by nature, and uh, some people, when they endure horrible trauma like this, retreat within their shells, and that's very understandable, and I don't blame people for doing that. Some people get a fire in their belly. I'm one of those people that gets a fire in their belly. My name is Nathan Zampronio. I am an ordinary person. I'm not a lawyer, nor am I a psychologist, nor am I really an expert in any field. Uh, I am merely somebody who has had some extraordinary and sad things happen in my own family that I'd like to share with you here today. It is said that the worst horror stories are those that begin with a, an everyday setting and where the familiar gradually gives way to the sinister. That is indeed what has happened in my own family. That's my family. That's me and my beloved, Kylie, and my son, Liam. I want to take you back to 2008. In 2008, I was in the 10th year of my marriage. Uh, my son was six was just completing kindergarten. Uh, I had worked in the same job uh, doing uh, IT, computers, at a private school. I'd been doing that for 10 years. Uh, I enjoyed my life. I ticked all of the boxes. Mortgage, child, station wagon, and I loved my life. I still do love my life. We were very anchored in our community. We were anchored in a, a local church fellowship. We had outside interests. My wife played soccer. Um, I trod the boards with a local dramatic society. And uh, there was every reason for us to wake up every morning and count our blessings. My wife, of course, um, had um, unfortunately been subject to episodes of mental illness, both throughout our marriage and beforehand. But you don't stigmatise such things, and it's just the one of the things that you bear along with your life partner to try and um, get through life, just as if a person had a, a physical malady. Um, she was a very vivacious, um, family-oriented person. The thing that caught my eye when I first met her was her wonderful smile. Um, two of those shots there were for when, when she did some modelling for Light and Easy. She'd lost some weight and she was very proud of it and she'd been on the Light and Easy Eating program and they were so impressed with her that they sent us up to Queensland at their expense to have a commercial filmed and she was on telly and we had some nice photos taken as a result. And um, because she had stayed at home while our son was very young, she wanted to get back into her career. She was trained as a nurse. and. Uh, she filled in shifts at reception at the school where I worked. I got her odd shifts working at the school. And we all went up there and played happy families. My, I was at the school. My son was at the school. It was nice to go to the same school as my son. My wife occasionally worked at reception. 
there's not a lot that's bad about a situation like that, but unfortunately that planted the very seed that led to everybody's undoing. The mental illness that I'm referring to uh, was depression, both, both postnatal and otherwise, that required significant medication, and something else that to this day is very difficult to articulate or diagnose in a formal way. But my wife was inclined to tell tall tales in order to gain sympathy from new friends. And this was episodic, and things usually improved, and by and large, as I said, we were, we were very happy. It was at the cusp of just such an episode, and because my wife was working odd shifts at the reception at the, at the school where we all went, she was befriended by a, a group. It was, this was a Christian private school, and there was a group. There's different Christian communities that intersect with a local school. That's to be expected. And uh, this group was in the outer orbit of that school and befriended my wife. And she was invited to a, a woman's group, a Bible study, if you will. And I was pleased that she'd made new friends. Um, by and by, these Bible studies seemed to become more intense, which is to say that she'd leave and she'd be out for hours and the time that she'd come home became later and later, uh, often without any uh, explanation as to what was happening. Uh, when I pressed her on the issue, she said, she said that she was being counselled and that there were some heavy issues that she was dealing with. And uh, she didn't come from a dysfunctional family by any stretch, but, uh, you know, I gave her the latitude to spend time with whom she chose and um, at, at the beginning at least I didn't think that that was sinister. However of course in time this situation became very much worse and she uh, got to the point where like midnight, on, a, on a given night midnight came and went and I had no idea where she was. And I couldn't reach her on the phone and I got a text message, not a phone call or a voicemail but a text message and not from her but from one of the people that she was being counselled by. Kylie not coming home tonight. All okay. Do not call. See you, she'll see you in the morning. And when she came home in the morning, again, there was no explanation. On the 4th of January 2009, she drove down our driveway to go to just such a women's gathering or a Bible study and said that she would be home for dinner. And I and my then six-year-old son waved her off as she drove down the road. And she has never been home since. Obviously, in a state of significant distress, I worked, tried to work out what was going on. What had actually been happening was that she was being counselled by a group who saw some measure of mental disturbance or distress and then took it upon themselves to diagnose her with what's called dissociative identity disorder, which used to be called multiple personality syndrome, and that she had endured horrific ritual satanic abuse at the hands of members of her family, and uh, this was the cause of her state. And uh, I, of course, wanted to support my wife, and yet felt profoundly sceptical about the claims that were being made. Now, uh, I want to draw some, uh, some common threads, I suppose, between my story and, and your stories. Uh, every story is different, and yet I think for, for my talk here today to be of any merit to you, I need to draw some, some, some common threads out of it, because not all of your stories are as cult-oriented as, as mine is. So in thinking about that, the first common thread that I came up with was that often, I would say most often, I think, when a person is on that kind of downward spiral, it rarely happens by itself, but there is some kind of outside agency or an exogenous outside encouragement for a person to start to contemplate and then articulate and then act upon false beliefs. In my wife's case, it was this pseudo-Christian group who took themselves to be counsellors and said that they had a particular ministry for people that suffered from ritual satanic abuse and dissociative mental conditions. Perhaps that's what's a common thread with some of your situations in the sense that there was a, a counsellor or a therapist or a psychologist or somebody who stood with the lost person in your family and exacerbated the situation and caused it to become out of hand. 
I therefore had to become a, a lay expert in the field of dissociative disorders. What I discovered, of course, as you probably already know, is that it's a profoundly contested diagnosis. Uh, the literature doesn't speak with one voice. There are people that are passionately in favour of it, and there are people that are passionately against it for various reasons. Now, I'm going to include in my presentation some documents that uh, I am sure you will find are so extraordinary, you will wonder how I came by them. So I will tell you now. Another family has lost their mother, their wife, their sister, auntie, to this cult, and the husband of that particular lady became so concerned about his wife's behaviour before she too was lost to this group that he started to collect pieces of paper around the house. This particular lady was deeply involved in my wife's therapy and there were notes relating to her therapy left all over the house that he squirrelled away or made copies of and then at the point that he lost his wife to the cult he then came to me and apologised for his previous obstructiveness and said, look, here's all of this incriminating material, do with it what you will. So that's why I have it, and you'll find it quite extraordinary. And you're looking at this funny pin-pricked diamond here, and you're thinking, well, what is that? This is a map of my wife's mind. The larger partitions represent rooms. The pinpricks represent individual personalities that it is said that my wife had manifested and that had to be dealt with. Many of these were given individual names. For example, the name Kylie was deprecated. I'll speak more about that shortly. But there was Hope, who had a gift of prophecy and prophesied on part, part of the group. Uh, truth, uh, Faith, Grace, Joy. Rather benign names, but uh, I can tell you, none of these people were my wife. In terms of the prophetic capacity that my wife was encouraged to, to, to manifest, you know, she would make pronouncements. Some of them had a, a kind of a uh, end times flavour to them. This group has form as a kind of an end times prophecy group. Wayne, this is Joy speaking, but God is the one that is talking to you through me. I was too scared to talk to you face to face, sorry, that's why I'm writing. These writings are very common. And what I'm showing you here, I can assure you, is merely the tip of the iceberg and is not even the best, but is just a representative sample as I've surfed through the material. It runs to hundreds of pages uh, to give you the, the flavour of it today. Um, God just told me that no one will, that, that the next one will be different. It will be like the other night when I couldn't fall unconscious or stare too long because of the risk of catatonia. He said to trap the astrals. Astrals are psychic travellers coven members, occult people that enter the spiritual realm, sail through the ether and then visit all kinds of spiritual maladies upon your person. This is what my wife was encouraged to do and to believe when she was at a profoundly vulnerable point. My wife was also encouraged to make explicit accusations against her own family. I confess that is very difficult to read, but she was tied up in a skipping rope uh, dragged around, uh, half strangled, uh, was forced to endure an abortion. Um, some of the personalities that she manifested had an infantile character. Uh, I know my wife's handwriting very well. I was married to her for 10 years. Um, this is a, a parody of who my wife is, and it was something that she was goaded to, I believe, at a point where she really needed to be under professional psychiatric care. These relate to specific claims or, you know, to relive a traumatic scenario and then to write it down. Eyes and arms and head, head held still, rope tied around neck and arms behind back on knees. If I move, neck snap, mouth taped open and semen inserted, swallow or suffocated. She was encouraged to draw pictures. Can't go to sleep all night, light on and off. Um, they tried to give me a needle, hurt me in my special place, held my nose and made me swallow. If I didn't, the needle would kill me. In addition to which this particular group believed that they had a special spiritual mantle to oppose, ironically, occult forces operating in the Blue Mountains and elsewhere. This is a list of coven members that they had identified uh, 
and they could, through their spiritual discernment and through no other means, uh, identify by their name, their age, their description, their vocation, and the kind of malady it was that they were bringing to bear upon my wife and the group as a whole. In the middle section there, that name Linda, at Harbord, is my aunt, who's a lovely lady, but apparently she entered the ether and sailed all the way from Harbord to the Blue Mountains to invisibly twist my wife's fallopian tubes. It is bizarre. If it wasn't so tragic, you would laugh. I won't blame you for smiling. This has had such a surreal character to it. My constant refrain over the last several years is this is the kind of thing that happens to other people, or in movies, or on television. Here's another collection. Again, people identified by name, the coven of which they were a member, uh, uh, what they looked like, often they had robes on, and the kind of malady that they were visiting upon this group. This was spiritual warfare, but it was ha happening in the ether. It was happening in an invisible sense. I went to go and sit down with this gentleman that lost his wife to this cult, and as I sat at his kitchen table, he pointed to the door and to the window, and he says, can you see a little smudge above the door there and a little smudge above the window? He says, that's the oil. That's the oil, and if you don't put the sign of a crucifix above the door with the oil, that gives them an entrance, and they'll come in and they'll attack you. It's paranoid, and it's dangerous. Um, my wife was encouraged to manifest, uh, to make particular claims, as I said. No matter where I was, the cult always knew. This cult that they're referring to isn't themselves, of course. This is my wife's family, her kith and kin. She has been encouraged to believe that her own family are Satanists and that she should spurn them and that she should cleave to this group and call them family, and she does now. Uh, smeared with dog poo, taken out the back, swimming. If I, dis if I disobey, I die. Um, stick pushed down throat, eyes burnt with a flaming stick. These are things that she was either supposed to have endured or witnessed because apparently she'd been torn out of her bed regularly when she was younger taken to secluded bush locations where circled, circled figures of hooded coven members would, would, would visit, you know. I mean, you know, there must have been thousands of people that have just disappeared off the face of the earth. And people that believe in Satanism actually believe that that's the case and that there's this mass conspiracy of people that are given over to the cult uh, covens for sacrificial purposes, but the, the, the statistics are always kind of concealed or downplayed. I will kill for the cult, baby out of mother, um, Endurance makes me stronger. Uh, my body belongs to the cult. They can do what they want with it. Um, this was an interesting one. If you ever saw a clothesline going around in the absence of any strong wind, apparently that's evidence of high spiritual activity in the area. And because my wife was encouraged to spurn her name and to take on a new identity, she was even told that her own name was a hateful name that was given to her by her family because it had the word lie in it. So my wife now goes by the name Hope Hopi. That's her Facebook page. There is a woman going around who is suffering very badly. She carries my wife's face, but I and her family barely recognize her anymore. And that's a source of intense grief to us, especially because my son, still misses his mother, still will occasionally cry for his mother, and I have to be both mother and fa father to him uh, now. This formerly vivacious and family-oriented lady lost her job working in the emergency department of Nepean Hospital. This particular letter indicates that uh, she just left without trace and that they'd held the position open for as long as they could, but uh, eventually couldn't do it anymore. And that leads me to the second common thread that I'd like to advance, and I hope I don't transgress any boundary by suggesting this, because to be accused as an intensely painful experience, but certainly in my family's experience, I've chosen to believe that an accuser, my wife in this case, is as much a victim as anybody. She has to bear a measure of responsibility for her poor choices, including her choice of friends, but there's, a, there's been as much done to her as things that she's done. And one of my challenges is to try and 
find a balance between those competing factors. In order to have this diagnosis confirmed, these people in the Blue Mountains took my wife down to a quack mob down in Canberra, a church called the Shepherd's Heart. They believe they have a special spiritual gifting to minister to people that suffer from dissociation. And thankfully, all of their ministry materials are available on the internet, videos, PDFs of their manuals, uh, audio interviews that they've done with radio stations and so forth. What do these people believe? Well, this is an extract from their ministry manual that mixes in a lot of pseudo-medical, pseudo-psychological terminology. For example, if a person has multiple personalities or dissociations, some of them could be demons and they need to be exorcised. And my wife was subjected to exorcism. Another thing they believe is that demons walk the earth in human guise this day and they're called Nephilim, which is a word from the Old Testament, and that uh, these uh, demons taking human form can mate with humans. And um, more extraordinarily, um, that some of these demons pilot UFOs and kidnap women and take them to a secret underground base in Mount Hermon in Israel where they are impregnated with half-demon, half-human embryos, some of which are brought to term, and those babies walk the earth today as sleeper demonic super soldiers and some of them are harvested before term for some nefarious or undisclosed purpose. Um, I find that extraordinary, not only that they would believe this, but that they would be prepared to say that publicly. More about that later. Because this particular group used a pseudo-medical, pseudo-psychological terminology, my, they did take my wife to a qualified psychologist who was prepared to give the following written endorsement. Each of my sessions with Ms Zampronio has been attended by a cult member who is Ms Zampronio's carer. Ms Zampronio is undertaking DID, dissociative treatment, from the Shepherd's Heart Centre in Canberra, which is being administered by a team of women. This has been the subject of an official complaint, and would you believe it, in the face of all of the evidence, that complaint was not upheld. So these, this psychologist was either duped or grossly negligent. And as we wended our way through the court process to resolve the custody of my son, which I got, and property, which I got, um, uh, you know, all of this information was subpoenaed. And it turns out that this psychologist was grossly negligent, and yet the system has done nothing. My wife's GP was prepared to also attest that my wife was enduring a therapy program from a psychologist and from other sources. This group also seemed to have it in for me because here was I standing desperately on the sidelines trying to rescue my wife from this awful fate. And um, the bad news for them is that they wrote what they thought about me down. And the worst news is that uh, that information has been passed to me. So this is in the handwriting of one of the leading figures in this cult, Nathan, getting info about our church. They are desperate. No weapon formed against us will prosper. They are going to hang themselves. I have been told that I will kill myself as a result of my opposition to this group. Tips to stop Nathan. He has set his course of destruction. He has been warned, pride, stubborn. Won't listen or refuse to go God's way. Wants to play dirty. And on it goes. I am sure they would have kittens if they knew that I had this. And they would have puppies if they knew that it was now being brought out at a conference and they would have elephants if they knew that I was going to be talking to a current affair next week. But stay tuned, as they say. And despite all of that evidence, which at this point they didn't quite know that I had, they sent me a nasty legal letter saying, we were instructed that in the family court, which is protected speech, I might add, at Parramatta, you did in public court make a statement to the effect that our clients are members of a cult. How dare you? The statement that our clients are members of a cult is untrue and highly damaging to our client's reputation. And on it goes. I was delighted when I received that letter. I've thought about having it framed, but we'll see. But I do want to return to the nub of this, and that is there is a, there is a human tragedy here. And my wife has lost so much, so much. She's lost her parents. She's lost her sisters. Those are her sisters and her mother and our boy. She's missed her sister's wedding. She's missed the birth of 
three different nieces or nephews, there's another one on the way. And um, I, I grieve every day about how evil this situation is. Before we become too morose and all slit our wrists, I want to let you know that we're, we're over the worst of this and my boy and I are doing well and thank you very much. Um, we're very, very, very close and we have the tremendous support of family, significantly uh, from my wife's family and uh, I've taken myself back to uni and I'm completing my masters and I'm involved in politics and uh, I have a range of other interests and he's absolutely thriving. That's my sister in the black and white photo. She's been more than an auntie and my mum's been more than a grandma. So the third common thread that I want to bring out is that if there's any aspect of this story that even slightly accords with the story in your own family, please know that you are not alone and there are people that will stand with you and that will grieve with you, regardless of how similar or how different those stories are. Well, that's my story. So the next section is what can be done. So I will cover briefly what it is that I have done, and then we'll move on from there. I have worked for state and federal politicians of a conservative view, and now that I'm over the worst of this situation, needing to first of all secure the safety of my son, which I've now done. I mean, he never left my side, but that had to be ratified legally, and, and property. Uh, I feel the need to poke this anthill with a stick, which I am now doing. And this is my first really public foray into starting to articulate this, not for some sense of catharsis on my part, but so that I can start to help others who are going through the same situation and hopefully bring the, le the state of politics to the point where this doesn't have to happen and there will be intervention or investigation adequate to the tragedies that are unfolding. Uh, I made a complaint to the Health Care Complaints Commission, firstly against the medical professionals that were ostensibly overseeing my wife's therapy, and uh, as I said earlier, that went absolutely nowhere. I made a complaint to the Health Services Commissioner, which is the equivalent body in the Australian Capital Territory, of course, this mob, the Shepherd's Heart, because they were using pseudo-medical and pseudo-psychological terminology, fell within their remit. And the good news is that the initial finding from the Health Services Commissioner was that, was that I was right. And they said, yes, look, at first blush, they do use a medical terminology and it should therefore be regarded as a therapy and we will investigate this. I was talking with David Millican earlier, who was beginning to investigate this group himself, and he says that that complaint slowed them down a little, and it's caused them to change their vocabulary, and it's caused them to put some caveats on the material that they use in their seminars and in their therapy and on their website, but it hasn't stopped them dead, and other people will suffer at the hands of these groups until we can really start to kind of turn the thumbscrews on them. Because I'm involved in politics, I started to engage in a process of research because I hit dead end after dead end with traditional mechanisms of complaint. And I found, to my very great interest, that a law that might help you and I get more justice in these situations had been considered many years ago. Now, there's this group called the Standing Committee of Attorneys General. It's a peak body of attorneys general around Australia. And they get together and they discuss things that, for example, might harmonise laws between different jurisdictions. And they then devolved to a committee to develop what's called a model criminal code. And each state or territory, or indeed the Commonwealth, has the right to then incorporate these well-considered, thought-through, uniform laws into their own bodies of law. And all the way back in 1998, the model criminal code was brought out and contained a very useful and novel definition of harm. The way I explain it to people is like this. If you commit a sexual assault against somebody, or a common assault, or perpetrate a financial fraud, the, the law will bring you to book. And the law will um, you know, provide some remedy to you know, censure and fine or imprison you for that infraction. However, if you are subject to psychological abuse, of the sort that I've just spent the last 20 minutes describing, there is no recourse in law. 
But here was the model criminal code 13 years ago proposing that a new definition of harm be adopted. A definition of harm that includes harm to a person's mental health, including significant psychological harm, but with some caveats, but not including uh, does not include mere emotion, ordinary emotional reactions such as those of only distress, grief or anger. And harm does not include being subjected to any force or impact that is within the limits of what is acceptable as incidental to social interaction or to life in the community. So it's been thought through to the extent that, you know, a law like this could be the thin end of the wedge and it could be open to abuse, but certainly more <coughs> needed to be done. A more generous interpretation of harm needed to be adopted. And to the best of my knowledge, this wasn't picked up. So I wrote to every Attorney General in Australia and every Shadow Attorney General in Australia, and I have recently only completed the process of collating those responses. A very interesting thing came out. In the Northern Territory, in their criminal code, they have. It's the only jurisdiction in Australia that has picked up this definition of harm, including psychological manipulation. So if your loved one was subject to some kind of quack therapy or coercive, you know, counselling or something that, that misled their normal, uh, you know, access to qualified psychological or psychiatric care and they were goaded or encouraged to believe things that were not true, that could be construed as psychological abuse and should fall under the remit of a, of a law like this. So where we are right now is making inquiries to the government in the Northern Territory to see whether uh, any prosecution has been brought to bear under this new definition and whether it serves the purpose that we hope that it might. And if, it, if the operation of this particular law in the Northern Territory has been unremarkable and has had the effect that we hope that it might, then we have a stronger case to make to other attorneys general around Australia to do the same in the States and also in the Commonwealth. And there's the extract from that very... Um, from that very uh, criminal code. It's basically identical to what's in the, the model criminal code. This is lifted from the, the criminal code in the Northern Territory. Now, um, because I work in a backbencher's office, um, I've got to point out that that, that, that that might sound impressive, but I can assure you it isn't. I am at the very bottom of the political food chain. However, I pulled every string I could conceivably pull. And this Thursday, gone, only several days ago, I had the privilege of going into the city and meeting with the Attorney General of New South Wales, Greg Smith, in his office, and he was extraordinarily generous with his time, and I sat with him for three quarters of an hour, and I articulated all of these concerns, demonstrated that my wife's case by itself demonstrated that existing laws are inadequate, and proposed this as a remedy. He wouldn't have a bar of it. <laughs> saying all of the predictable responses that there was a danger that uh, this would be the thin end of the wedge, that conventional religious organisations would be taken to task. Um, it's worth pointing out that Greg Smith is himself a Catholic, so the Catholic Church at certain times has endorsed the process of uh, exorcism. Um, uh, but he did express some genuine curiosity because he was unaware that this definition of harm had been applied in the Northern Territory and wanted to know more. So it's not as though the process is finished in New South Wales with my appointment with him. Uh, he was very personally sympathetic, I might add, but uh, wearing his Attorney General's hat, he needs to be very leery of what he thinks are radical changes to the law, uh, a, a new definition of assault, for example. So that's the kind of work that I've been engaged in, and I've been assisted by people like uh, Dr Stephen Much, who was a, himself a former uh, state and federal politician, while he had his political career, he was uh, uh, accused of um, some misdeeds, they could have been sexual or moral or otherwise, by a group known as Kenja, that you may have heard of. Of course, those allegations were untrue, they simply had it in for him. And now he's retired from politics, he lectures at Macquarie University. And he's done a lot of research, and um, you know we've worked very closely on trying to work out whether there's more that can be done on the legislative front. So what needs to be done? Well, we need to continue to press this cause. We need to lobby politicians, uh, not only with 
your stories, but with suggested remedies like the one that I've brought to your attention today. And I say that with the greatest of respect to many of you who have been doing precisely that for very, very many years and in a particularly distinguished and unflagging way. I am a relative newcomer to this. And we need to find cause, common cause with other organisations. Now, next week I will be going down to Parliament House in Canberra where another organisation called the Cult Information and Family Support Network are holding their national conference. We have the um, privilege of hosting that in Parliament House because a Liberal Senator, Sue Boyce, has been prepared to sponsor us to hold it in one of the conference rooms at Parliament House. And we have assembled what we believe is a distinguished list of speakers, including Professor Patrick McGorry, who is Australian of the Year and a leading advocate for mental health causes, and Senator Nick Xenophon, the independent senator from South Australia, who is a trenchant anti-cult campaigner and who has had some success in the sense that if you look at larger name brand cults, there is now a public benefit test that is being enacted in law, so that there has to be some justification for larger cult groups to apply for tax exemption. I would say, however, that there are very many more of these smaller fly-by-night groups. The group that took my wife doesn't have a name. Um, it's just a group of wacky families. And I'd say, by volume, there are very many more individual quack counsellors, therapists, religious gurus, fly-by-nighters, that have goaded your loved ones and mine to make accusations against their families and there needs to be something more generic in law rather than something that only targets large name brand cults. So there's been a good start, but the particular area that we're talking about uh, hasn't, um, hasn't been uh, sufficiently addressed. So look at, the, uh, look at the, um, the media release associated with this particular conference in, um, in Canberra. The behaviour and actions of some of these groups results in a legacy of mental, physical and financial damages to individuals and families. Does that des describe your family, from which many may never fully recover? It goes on about freedom of religious belief, and we have tried very carefully to distance this from a religious liberties argument. Politicians will run a mile uh, from any suggestion that you're trying to infringe on freedom of speech, freedom of association, or a person's religious <coughs> liberties. And we are trying very hard to uh, confine our legislative lobbying to conduct. Conduct that results in harm to people. Um, we need to establish a formal body to examine these groups with more scrutiny. We need to adopt a criminal offence of intentionally or recklessly causing psychological harm, such as what I just described. Uh, we need to have an education campaign. We need to strengthen the powers of the Healthcare Complaints Commission. When I went to the Healthcare Complaints Commission, I did so aware that they had inherited new powers um, uh, only a few years ago to investigate people that had never held a professional qualification. In other words, you can deregister a doctor that does the wrong thing, or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but what about a person that hangs up a shingle and has never been a member of a professional association? This is something we've been lobbying against all the time. That's right. And just very recently as well. And the thing is, the Healthcare Complaints Commission has statutory powers to negatively register or to publicly name and shame people that do this kind of thing, but otherwise did not have any qualification. Um, you know, there's... there's, there's Are you referring to the um, New South Wales... Healthcare Complaints Commission, that's right. So my, my, my claim is that they don't necessarily need new powers, they need to be given a specific directive from the Health Minister, for example, not to squib their use of those powers that they already have, and to be more proactive in investigating people that take vulnerable people in, subject them to a process of therapy that um, does them no good at all, uh, and ends up separating them from their families and having them making these, these terrible accusations. Um, Two of the speakers that will be at this conference next week are um, Monsieur Georges Fenech, uh, who's a part of an organisation in France that isn't just an anti-cult organisation in the community. The French have gone much further than anybody else in pursuing cults. Miviludes is a government department that is charged with going out and finding out who's damaging people with this kind of conduct and keeping a register of them and subjecting them to some kind of censure. And we're going to hear from him about the efforts that have been made in France. Also, Tom Sackville, who's a member of FECRIS, which is a uh, European 
uh, anti-cult organisation. He'll be coming out and giving his perspectives from the UK and the European perspective generally. Um, Stephen Much, the gentleman that I was referring to before, Senator Nick Xenophon, a Green senator. It's much easier to get action on this from the left-hand side of politics. I regret that fact. I'm from the right-hand side of politics. We are being sponsored at this conference by a Liberal senator, and that's very welcome. Um, and then three people to give uh, small, cut-down versions of what I'm basically telling you now, my testimony. I've got 15 minutes. And, of course, the purpose of this is to... Um, is to have as many MPs in the room as we can and to uh, impress upon them the pressing need for uh, action in this area. And then to cap, it, to cap it all off, I had a call from a current affair who had caught wind of the conference and the list of speakers and wanted a human angle and wanted to speak to me as uh, my story being one example of the need for these conferences in the first place. You know, why is there a need for conference? Why is there a need for stronger laws? Well, this story is one of many that could be told, but should be able to do some good. So I've told you what my story is, what's happened in my family, what I've personally tried to do to try and bring some understanding or justice to the situation, and I've offered some hopefully constructive suggestions about what needs to be done uh, legislatively in terms of lobbying and so forth, and that concludes my presentation, and thank you very much for your time. Anybody?